Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Gainesville United Methodist Church. Would you all stand up? We're going to work with Jesus this morning. Come on, let's stand up. Let's sing this together. I saw. And I saw Satan fall like lightning. And I saw darkness from for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. Oh, I believe, I believe in signs and wonders, and I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. testimony from death to life cause grace we wrote my story I'll testify oh my like Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony this is my testimony yeah Listen, come together Together, sons and daughters, walk with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Oh yes, our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony. Oh. Come on, declare this together, church. If I'm not dead, you're not done. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to go. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to go. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to go. Testimony from death to life, cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. Oh, I Jesus Christ the righteous. I'll justify. This is my testimony. Now I'm alive. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. Christ the righteous, I'll justify. This is my testimony. This is my testimony.
This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. Sing that. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. and pray with me real quick, church. Lord Jesus, we praise you. We glorify your name this morning. We praise you for your continual blessings in our lives, for your goodness. Lord Jesus, I pray we wouldn't forget those blessings. That not only will we praise you for them, but we would recognize our blessings and want to bless other people, Lord God. That we want to share the love with other people with what you have blessed us with, Lord Jesus and we would recognize how good you are to us. That a shift in mindset would change this morning, Lord Jesus. So we just thank you. We thank you for this time of worship. We pray it would continue throughout the rest of the service. Your spirit will work and do amazing things. It wouldn't stop here, but it would just keep getting better, Lord. So we thank you. We pray this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Good morning, church. It's great to be with you. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Yeah, happy Father's Day. I don't know about you. Father's Day is kind of depressing for me because I'm just like, man, God, you're such a better father than me. And then I move on with my day. So anyways, happy Father's Day. You're not as good as God. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to Gainesville Church. My name is Vincent McGlone. Yes, I am one of the pastors here, as much as it may surprise you, and it is a joy to be worshiping with you this morning, and a warm welcome to everybody worshiping with us online. Uh, summer at Gainesville uh, is a great time. We are just doing as many things as we can to help people build uh, community in the course of the summer, and we want to let you know about a few specific things we have coming up. Uh, first of all, this Friday, uh, a group of us from church will be hanging out at the Farm Brewery uh, at Broad Run, Friday starting at 6, so come hang out with us. We have a spot reserved there, uh, and our encouragement for everybody is also to invite uh, a friends or friends that you have who do not go to church to come join us there. It's our way of being out in the community uh, and I think showing people that this is a really cool church and part of our vision here at Gainesville Church to always be intentional about bringing one more into the kingdom of God. We also want to make uh, mention of a couple of our other summer events that are going to be coming up here soon. Uh, this past weekend, we did our trivia night, team trivia on Friday. There's going to be another one of those here in August. Uh, we also had our first of the family nights this past, or for the summer this past Saturday. Um, a few others I wanted to make mention of, Benson already talked about the brewery nights, but we have multiple family nights that are going to be coming up later in the summer. Those dates should be up there now. Uh, the uh, international meals, the first one is going to be on June 26th. 
the uh, Ravichandras are going to be bringing uh, very nice Indian cuisine for everybody. And if you're planning on coming to that, we just ask that you bring a, a side or a dessert. Uh, but it should be a really fun evening. Uh, we also have a moms group that's going to be starting on Mondays on June 27th. Uh, if you want a little more information about that, you can speak to our connections director, uh, Lisa. Uh, she, oh, she's over there. She'll be back in, in the uh, uh, lobby after the service. And at her table, it's going to be one of these handy-dandy postcards with all of the big summer events that are going to be coming up. We recommend that you take one of these home, put it on your fridge, put it in a place that you'll see it often, because there's a lot of really fun events and a great opportunity for you to connect with other families here at the church. We also want to make mention uh, of all of our graduates, both high school and college graduates. You can see some of the names up there on the screen in a moment. We have a lot of students that graduated... Uh, from, it's not in the slideshow? We will get that fixed for 11 o'clock. Uh, it is a, a great honor that we have uh, so many graduates that are here as part of our youth program, either currently part of the youth program or left our youth program to go to college a couple of years ago that have, been, that have graduated. Um, it is absolutely wonderful to, to see all of these next steps being taken by these students, as many of whom that we've known for a very, very long time. Um, and it's just, we want to shout out all of those uh, awesome students and wish you the best of luck as you continue on with your future endeavors. We also want to pray for them, and we're going to combine that with our prayer before the sermon. So if you would bow your heads and pray with me. Lord, we just give you thanks. We give you thanks for this church. Not for the building, but for the people that you have brought here. For the people you've allowed us to serve and to connect with, and we just give you praise. This morning especially, we left up to you the fathers in our church. We ask for uh, an outpouring, an abundance of wisdom and strength to be given to them as they uh, continue to parent, whether it is a newborn all the way up to an adult child. Lord, that you would just give them strength and love and kindness and gentleness and wisdom in all that they do for their children and their families. We pray for our graduates, those graduating from high school and beginning a new season of life in college and those graduating from college and beginning a new season of life in, uh, in the world, Lord, we pray your blessing upon them. We pray that you would give them a maturity beyond their years. But above all else, Lord, we pray that you would just open their hearts to be used by you however you wish, to be uh, a light in, in this world and to be an influence of your love and your goodness and of Jesus Christ to all those that they come in contact with. We pray for Pastor John this morning. We pray for his message that I'm just so excited to hear, Lord, and, and we pray that our ears and our hearts and our minds would be open to it, that in doing so we would receive your wisdom, Lord, that our lives would be changed, that wisdom would be gained, that we would be able to share that and live that out in our lives, that it wouldn't just simply stay in this room, but it would carry us through the week, that it would carry us uh, in the months to come, Lord, that we would just become more and more and more your disciples. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, I, I love our staff. Look what's up on the screen. During the prayer, Adam went back put the slide into the uh, projector, and there are our graduates for this year. So, congratulations to our graduates. You know, as you were clapping, that was the rhythm at annual conference that this really dynamic worship leader, annual conference is where all the clergy and laity have to go every year. Benson and I just got back, tried to get the congregation, which was all clergy, to clap like that, it lasted, Adam, all of about 15 seconds, and it was done by about 20 people. So getting Methodists to clap, I think, is an impossibility. I think the term Methodist and clapping just can never go together, except if we're doing a round of applause for something. So maybe it's just not in our DNA. This morning's message is entitled, These Things need to be said out loud. I want you to hear this scripture. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. 
with praise and thanksgiving. This is the Word of God. I want you to get a piece of paper out. I want you to write these things down because they're important. There are things in this world that we should keep to ourselves, that we should not say out loud. In fact, that would be good advice to everyone who's on Facebook who, say, who says things that are they would never say in person. They would never say that face to face with someone. Those things too should be kept to yourself. But there are certain things that must be said out loud. And I've got four of them for you this morning. First one is I love you. From time to time at least, we need to say to the people that we love the most that we do love them. We need to say it, they need to hear it. Now I have a movie reference, shocker that, and it's an old movie, shocker that, and worse than that, it's a musical and nobody likes musicals. So here we go. A 1971 musical about a community of Jewish people in Russia called Fiddler on the Roof. It's a movie where the main character is Tevia, who's married to Golda, and they have three daughters. The story picks up that the three daughters don't want to marry in an arranged marriage. That's why we, the way marriages were done in those days. I don't think anyone here is in a marriage that was arranged by a third party. Well, that's the way they did it in the 19th century. They had arranged marriages, and they didn't want to be in those arranged marriages, so they petitioned their father, and Tevia is going through all these machinations of how he can get his daughters married to the people that they really want to be married to. But that also got him thinking, because they said, I want to marry the man that I love. It got him thinking about love in his own marriage to Golda, his wife. And so because it's a musical, they start singing to each other. I'm not going to sing to you, I'm just going to say the words. Don't worry, I'm not singing this morning. But it starts off with Tevia saying to his wife, do you love me? And she responds, do I what? And he says, do you love me? Do I love you? With our daughters getting married and this trouble in the town, you're upset, you want out, go inside. Go lie down. Maybe it's indigestion. Tevius says back to his wife, I'm asking you a question. Do you love me? His wife responds, you're a fool. Tevius says, I know, but do you love me? Do I love you? For 25 years, I've washed your clothes, cooked your meals, cleaned your house, given you children, milked the cow. After 25 years... Why talk about love now? Because we need to hear it. It's built into our DNA. I know I've told you love is an action word, and it is. It's a word that we show our love with the actions that we do. And Golda says that right there. I've milked the cow. I've given you children. I've washed your clothes, prepared your meals. If that's not love, what is? Well, we are hardwired folks to need to hear the phrase said to us, I love you. It needs to be said out loud. You wouldn't believe how many people I talk with who are insecure, even in the relationships that mean the most to them. Husband and wife, parent, child, friends. That they struggle to know that they're loved. And it makes them insecure. So on this Father's Day, I want you to go around and tell the people that you love the most. Let them know it. Say that simple phrase, I love you. Say it out loud. It's one of those phrases that needs to be said out loud. And while you're at it, I want you to look to the guy who died on that cross, who loved you so much that he came into the world in the person of Jesus, God of creation, who came into the world in the person of Jesus, died on that cross to show you how much he loves you. Tell him that you love him. It needs to be said out loud. Another one needs to be said out loud is, may I help you? It's kind of like the love thing in action. May I help you? By the way, you don't say, can I help you? 
at least not in the household I grew up in. My father was an English major. He'd look back at me if I said, can I help you? And say, well, I don't know. Can you? Are you physically capable of doing it? Or are you asking if you, can, if you may help me? You see, can I help you is one of those things that doesn't say I'm offering my help, at least in my house. Hi, Dad. I know you're watching. At least in my house, because I called him last night to make, uh, make sure I had his wisdom down correctly. But when we say, may I help you, it's one of those things that needs to be said out loud. Sometimes people were sitting around waiting to be asked to do something. What a powerful statement it is to walk up to someone and say, may I help you? May I help you with those dishes? May I help you with the yard work? May I help you with the ushering at church? May I help you because I think you could use some help and I love you? It's one of those things that we need to say out loud. May I help you? It's one of the action words of the word love. Don't wait to be asked. Say it out loud. May I help you? Families, children to parents, parents to children, people within a church. How much better would Gainesville Church be if every single person would say, may I help you? What can I do to help? Where can I serve? May I help you is a great phrase, and it needs to be said out loud. The third one that I have for you, actually I have five, not four. The third one that I have for you, this is a big one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry is a phrase that we use to apologize. Ideally, we use it when we are acknowledging our culpability or our fault. Something that we said, something that we did was wrong. And we're saying, I'm sorry, I did that. But often, when we make our apologies, I'm sorry comes with conditions. I'm sorry, but this happened. I'm sorry, but you made me upset because you said this. I, it's not really an apology, folks. A wise person once said, if you get a phrase that has a but in it, ignore what comes before it and only listen to what comes after it. Because generally that's what's true. I'm sorry, but is not really an apology. I've heard I'm sorry said a lot of different ways. Here's one of the ones that I love. Fine, I'm sorry. In other words, stop talking. I've heard enough. Fine, whatever. I'm sorry. Or another version of that is, I'm sorry, I'll say anything to get you to stop talking. Now that's not said, that's implied. It's implied by the look. I'm sorry, just please shut up. That's not an apology either. Another one is the but apology. I'm sorry, but you got me upset and you shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry, but you said X, Y, and Z, and that hurt me. All of a sudden, I'm putting the blame back on you. Not much of an apology. The worst one is the angry version. I'm sorry! You know what that is? That's a threat. That's even a threat almost of violence. In other words, what it's saying is, if you say anything more, I'm going to make you more sorry than I ever could have been. The best apology. The best I'm sorry is one that's followed with, will you forgive me? And nothing more. I'm sorry, will you please forgive me? You put the ball in the other person's court. It's now up to them to choose whether or not they're going to forgive you. Scary, isn't it? It's a scary place to put yourself. You're giving up your power. You're giving up your negotiating rights. You don't know if you're going to be forgiven. But if you have a Christian person that you're saying you're sorry to, you know and they know that Jesus told them that they must forgive. 
But that's little consolation because there's that scary thing that's going on inside of you. I had the opportunity to negotiate away some of the blame. And when I say I'm sorry, will you please forgive me, I've stopped the negotiation. Now, we all know there is no such thing as a one-sided problem, a one-sided argument, even a one-sided divorce. They all have two sides to them. But when you say, I'm sorry, will you please forgive me, you are done negotiating what percentage of the blame lies with the person that you're apologizing to. Because let's face it, when I'm negotiating with you about how much blame you should bear, it's hard for you to hear my apology. I'm sorry. Will you please forgive me? And there are two really great things that come out of that kind of an apology. First, I'm telling the other person, I'm owning my mistake. I'm taking full ownership of what I said or what I did. I'm not trying to shift blame. See, a lot of people think that if you can assign the blame, you've somehow accomplished something. You accomplish nothing by assigning blame. Everybody probably already knew what was to blame or who was to blame. No, you don't fix anything by simply assigning blame. The second thing that happens is when I take responsibility for my own action, my own part in it, when I give up my negotiating rights to try to put the blame back on you, there's a chance for healing to begin. And so the question you need to ask yourself when you want to hold on to that negotiating ability, that ability to shift the blame to the person, and you say to them, I'm sorry, please forgive me, you're saying, I think it's more important to begin to heal than to continue to fight and assign blame. To begin to heal. I'm sorry. Will you please forgive me? That's a phrase that needs to be said out loud. And you know what? Maybe it wasn't all your fault. It never is all one person's fault. But when you have the courage, and it comes from the Holy Spirit, and you can ask for the courage, the courage to take your share of the blame and simply say, I'm sorry, will you please forgive me? You give healing a chance to begin. The next one, this one may be as difficult, maybe even more difficult, saying I'm sorry is to say I forgive you. We live in a society that teaches us not to forgive. We live in a society where we don't have discussions anymore. We have shout battles. And the group that has the most voices and yells the loudest wins the discussion group that says it has the moral high ground, they're told that it doesn't matter if you hurt someone with your words or with your actions. If you're in the right, good enough. Jesus would differ with that. Jesus would say that when someone hurts us, someone offends us, we need to learn to forgive. Peter came to Jesus and he said he was thinking he was being this really uh, magnanimous person by saying, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times, Peter said? See, in Jewish culture, the rabbi, rabbis taught that forgiving three times was good enough. Jesus said, no, not seven times, Peter, but 70 times seven. And it wasn't even 490 that he was talking about. He was talking about an infinite number. An infinite number. And so Jesus is saying to us, Learn to forgive. Learn to say, I forgive you. It's a tough job. I'm going to paraphrase something that John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, said. He was confronted one time with a pastor who was afraid he was losing his faith. And so John Wesley looked at him and he said, Brother, preach faith. He said, Brother Wesley, I'm not sure you heard me. I think I'm losing my faith. He said, preach faith. I'm going to paraphrase that and say, if you 
are struggling to forgive. Say, I forgive. Say it again and again and again out loud. Say it out loud and put the person's name in it. I forgive XYZ person for what they did. And you still don't feel like forgiving? Say it again and eventually, as Wesley said about faith, preach it until you find it again. Keep saying it until you feel it with forgiveness. Say it again and again and again. Because I'll tell you, folks, the thing that is often not acknowledged about lacking in forgiveness. By the way, anyone hear no word well enough to know or no grammar well enough to know if unforgiveness is a word or not? Because every time I type it into word, it gets me that red squiggly line underneath. And then I tap on it, and it doesn't give me any alternatives of spelling. So I think unforgiveness must not be a word, but I like the word. When you're unforgiving or you are lacking in forgiveness, keep saying that you forgive. Because the ironic thing about holding on to unforgiveness or lack of forgiveness is that it's like a cancer and it eats you up from the inside. You think it's a fire keeping you warm? It's a fire burning you up. It causes stress. It causes you to wake up in the middle of the night. It causes you to ruminate, to go over and over again, that thing that that person did to you. It's tearing you up inside. And you know the funny thing about it? That person's probably already forgotten about it. So if you can't forgive for love's sake, Forgive for God's sake. Forgive for your own sake. Learn to say, I forgive you. Even if the person's not there, name the person. Name the event. And keep saying it. I forgive you. I forgive you. Say it out loud. Don't let unforgiveness eat at your heart and tear you apart. The last one is the one that came from the scripture this morning. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, that's what Paul is saying. You confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and you believe in your heart, you will find salvation. Well, I told you last week that to truly understand the Apostle Paul, you need to understand the context. Now, Paul wrote nothing but letters. That's the first context you need to remember. It's a letter written to a group of people, probably trying to solve some challenge or some problem within that church. Well, he writes this one to the church in Rome, and Rome is the heart of the Roman Empire, and Rome is a place where Christians are regularly persecuted. He's telling them, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, you'll be saved. Well, it's a little bit different in those days than it is today. Confessing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior was like putting a target on your back. I'm standing up here in this Roman world that is hostile to Jesus, that regularly persecutes his followers, and I'm saying out loud, I'm all in. I'm committed to this thing. It's not like today, you know, the forms that we used to fill out, I don't know if they're still legal, where they ask you your name, your address, your email address, best phone number to reach you, what religion do you practice, and you check a box. I'm a Christian. I'm Jewish. I'm Muslim. No. In Rome, if you confessed with your mouth that Jesus Christ was Lord, if you said that out loud, you were committing everything. In our world today, we hear that, and we think, well, it's no big deal. I believe. I've confessed. Maybe not out loud, but we do need to. We need to say it out loud that I choose to follow this Jesus. Not just believe in him, I choose to follow this Jesus. I choose to say to Jesus, today I'm yours, what would you have me do? Where are you calling me to serve today? Not just, oh, I believe, I believe, but I choose to follow Jesus. Because that's what happened in the first century. You didn't have this cozy little middle ground where you sat back and go, I believe. No, that could cost.
cost you everything. It could cost you your freedom. It could cost you your livelihood. It could cost you even your life. So when Paul wrote those words, the context was based in that. We need to learn to say out loud more often, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I choose this day, today, to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Today, I confess that I love Jesus. Today, I confess that I want to be the hands and feet of Christ in this world today. I love him and I'm following him. I'm asking him what's his calling for my life today. Where do you want me to go today? That's that kind of all-in commitment. When you've confessed with your mouth and you believe in your heart and you did it because of a very conscious decision, well thought out, you've counted the cost. You see, a funny thing that I've noticed among people who become Christians later in their lives, that they've looked at the words of Jesus and they've asked themselves, is it worth it? Is it worth it to follow Jesus? Because they look at what the cost is, and they go, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Great story. And I've told it before, but I'm going to tell it again because it illustrates the point so well. And that is of a campus pastor in Colorado who had a young man that he had built a relationship with for almost the entire semester talked with him, had coffee with him, answered his questions about Jesus, showed him the Bible, read passages to him, let the man have his Bible and read it for himself. And one day, this man was close to making a decision about Jesus. And he was supposed to have coffee with the campus chaplain. And the chaplain called him up and said, hello, got no answer. Long before cell phone. He called him again that day, no answer. Called him again on Sunday, no answer. Called him again on Sunday, no answer. Finally, he sees him on campus. And he says, dude, where were you? We were supposed to have coffee and talk about Jesus. He said, yeah, I know. I spent the weekend up in my room smoking weed and asking myself whether or not Jesus was enough for me to give up my bomb. See, that man was making a conscious decision about following Jesus Christ. He is counting the cost. We who've grown up in the church, we've gotten our own little map of how we can circumvent the words of Jesus. We have. We've got this little map in our head that says, well, I don't really need to do that. And I did this one once. But no, I, I, I can have this attitude and still be a follower of Jesus Christ. No. The non-Christian looks at it and goes, I'm going to follow Jesus. This is what it means. No halfway measures. No halfway measures. So I'm asking you this morning, have you said it out loud? I love Jesus. I believe. I'm going to follow. And I'm asking you also, have you counted the cost of what it means to be a follower of Jesus? I promise you this, that when we do, when we say it out loud, after counting the cost, we will find the greatest joy that we will ever know in this world. When we truly are following Jesus, knowing what we might need to give up, we will find the greatest joy. Jesus told us, he said, I want my joy to be in you that your joy would be complete. His joy, doing what he was sent to do. Doing what he was sent to do, which was to die on that cross. He knew joy. He wanted that joy to be ours. When we said it out loud, I'm confessing Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I believe it in my heart follow him to be his hands and feet. You know what I do know? That Gainesville Church would have people who all said that out loud and went out to be the hands and feet of Christ 
our community would be exponentially better. Our community would be a warmer place to live, a better place to live. Our region would be better because we had thought it out, we made a conscious decision, and we said it out loud. I believe in Jesus Christ. I will follow him. I will be his hands and feet. Have you ever done that? Have you ever had that decision to surrender to this dusty carpenter who lived almost 2,000 years ago, who preached and taught and did miracles for three years to show the world that he really was who he said he was, God in human flesh. And then he died on a cross to break the power of sin and death in my life and in your life, that we might know life both here and for eternity. And then he rose again three days later why? To prove that he was who he said he was, that the gift that he was offering was real, that the brokenness could be healed, that we could know life, we could know joy, we could know abundant life. Have you ever said yes to that, Jesus? Made that conscious decision. Thought it out. Realized that changes would need to be made. But if you've already made that decision, I'd like you to say it out loud this morning. This is another thing Methodists are not known for. Verbally responding to a message. We, we, we don't do that very well. There are very few praise the Lord or hallelujah or preach it or amens even. But I want you to say it out loud today with an amen. And I'm giving you a warning so you can get prepared. If you've made that conscious decision to be a follower of Jesus Christ, that you've confessed with your mouth, that you believe in your heart, I want you to say it out loud right now with a great amen. On the count of three, say it to Jesus with an amen. One, two, three. Amen. Oh, this must not be a Methodist church. It sounded almost like a Baptist church. Who knows what will happen if we do that again. Jesus wants us to know his joy. His joy is found in being his hands and feet. But it's a decision. A decision that is consciously made. Not made for us, but made after serious thought. That I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let's bow our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray right now that if there are those here who have never made that conscious choice, that they could do so right now to confess with their mouths, believe in their hearts, and choose to follow Jesus Christ. Lord, our challenges in this world are great. But when we choose to walk alone, it's so much greater. You told us that if we choose to follow you, you will walk with us every step of the way. That by your Holy Spirit, you will empower us to truly be what we were created to be. To be made whole again. To have our brokenness healed. To be empowered. To be the hands and feet of Christ. Lord, I pray that for this congregation, for each one who's made that choice, and for those who haven't, I pray that you would come into their hearts. Come in, Lord Jesus, and make us whole. In your name, amen. Amen. Well, would you stand? We're going to sing this last song together.
Oh, your mercy never fails. And all my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. led me through the fire in the darkest night. You were close like no other. I know you as a
Learn to forgive. Learn to ask to help. May I help you? And then finally, finally confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. Surrender now. You want to know the goodness of God in your life? You want to know the joy of Jesus made full in you? Do those five things. Go in peace. Go knowing that you are loved, supremely loved, by the God of creation.